Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Theory from the Margins uh, webinar. Um, yeah, we are back in the new year, 2021. Hope the year is off to a good start for all of you. Um, so a quick um, word of intro about who we are. We are a consortium. We deep read on current scholarship on post-colonial theory, the decolonial turn, and theory building from the global south. Uh, we read works from marginalized communities in the global north and south and our critical interventions based on in-depth studies of marginalized groups. Theory from the Margins is primarily interested in the contemporary global academics engagement with what we understand to be theory. So uh, uh, very quickly, who are we here? Uh, well, I am Bodhisattva. I am um, Bodhi for short. I am associate professor in global culture studies at the University of Oslo. Um, uh, we also have uh, Momita Shen, who is associate professor in culture studies at MF Oslo, and uh, Sindre Bangsta, who is a research professor at Kifo Oslo, and Kristin Sora Batman Galeci, who is associate professor in Middle East studies at the Department of Culture Studies, University of Oslo. Uh, and we also have a, a special guest today uh, in. Um, uh, who will also be part of the panel discussion, uh, Michelle uh, Antoinette Tisdell, who is research librarian at the National Library of Norway. And now to introduce our guests, uh, Sindre. A very well, a warm welcome to all of you, um, and especially our very distinguished guests. We are very honored uh, to be able to start off this uh, season with uh, uh, professor Kamari Clark and uh, Assistant Professor Ryan Cecil Jobson of uh, the University of Toronto and the University of Chicago, respectively. And now I'm not going to waste your, your time, but uh, merely provide a, a few words of introduction to uh, Professor Clark and, uh, and Professor Jobson. So, um, Kamari Maxine Clark is professor at the University of Toronto, the author, author of eight books and well over 50 uh, national journal articles, in, including the uh, 2019 uh, monograph Effective Justice, which was published by Duke University Press, and the 2009 Fictions of Justice, published by Cambridge University Press. Kamara Clark uh, is uh, for want of a better term, uh, an anthropologist of law. Um, and the key text of, of, of hers that we will uh, be discussing today is her 2010 uh, current anthropology article toward uh, a critically, critically engaged ethnographic practice. And now to Ryan Cecil Jobson. Um, I should perhaps start out by saying that um, it's the first time I, I meet Professor Clark. I've uh, had the fortune, good fortune, to spend some time with uh, Professor Jobson, uh, whom I first met, met uh, at the back of a, a taxi going from the airport in Minneapolis uh, and, and to a conference hotel at the 2016 uh, American. Uh, annual meeting of the American Anthropological Association. Uh, Ryan Cecil Jobson is uh, now by our family assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago. He specializes on issues relating to energy and sovereignty in the Caribbean and is currently completing his first monograph, uh, an historical ethnography of Trinidad and Tobago as a petro, petro state. Uh, now, his uh, 2020 article for American Anthropologist, uh, The Case for Letting Anthropology Burn, um, has become a, a sort of starting point for a lot of interesting discussions within anthropology and, and beyond. And it is also one of the two key texts that we will we'll be discussing here today. So without further ado, uh, ado I, I, I leave the floor uh, to uh, Professor Clark uh, and after that, uh, Professor Jobson for their introductions. Thank you, Professor 
Thanks, Ted. Um, and thank you, of course, to the consortium for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be part of this conversation today. So in my remarks, my opening remarks, I'll argue for the development of a, a radical humanism of practice in anthropology. And in, in many ways, it's an extension of the article that we that you read, um, I guess, this, this month. Uh, but it, it, of course, that article was written 11, 12 years ago. And uh, this, this work ahead around radical humanism and anthropology is part of a, a, a larger um, work by a larger consortium of, of colleagues. Uh, and in particular, my colleague, Deborah Thomas. Uh, and so I'll argue for the development of a radical humanism of practice and anthropology, one that will require learning new ways of seeing theory and consolidated commitments to ethnographic practice. And specifically, my comments today presume the need to radically rethink our approaches to cultural worlds through a knowledge power nexus constituted in the global south that demands a social justice focus at its core. But my focus today is on consolidated commitments to decolonial anthropology that involves a particular set of engaged practices. I realized that over the past 50 years, the vociferous decolonizing work has surrounded anthropological critique from Talal Assad and Faye Harrison to Michelle Roth Trouillot, Sylvia Winter, Zoe Todd, uh, Audra, Simpson, the list goes on and on. The call to decolonize the discipline of anthropology has been bold and is not new. What distinguishes it, the, today's call is the urgency for moving away from viewing decolonial efforts as matters of individual failures that can be addressed alone by personal reworking of thinking and practice. And instead, we're calling today for a decolonial, decolonial uh, approach that can undo the fictional coherence of social science logics and modernity's claim on particular institutional norms as standards, which produce particular forms of knowledge centered in the North. We're calling for an approach that cannot be separated from the imbrication of these logics with the structure of the modern neoliberal university and its ties to political, juridical, and economic power. Today, students and faculty alike are demanding the end to the valorization of a field dominated by white scholars in the North. This, this, this field has suggested uh, that other modes of thought, writing, and practices are at the margins or in need of translation. This organization of anthropological knowledge emerged beyond Western histories of subordination of difference and through particular scientific methods that made it difficult to see beyond our interlocutors as mere data points or as fodder for contemplation. From calls for abolition to demands for reform, students today want to learn not only the history of the discipline, but also ped pedagogical tools that allow them to interrogate, unpack, and at times provincialize histories of intellectual violence, including particular structures of knowledge, power, teaching forms and genealogies that are part of contemporary anthropology departments everywhere. We work within a field whose analytic tools emerged out of a colonial experience, a field in which colonial knowledge domains continue to structure what counts as anthropological knowledge. Meanwhile, in the global south, ethno ethnography's tools are being reformulated and abandoned at times destabilizing the forms of knowledge that have shaped anthropology's colonial methods. Such reformulations call, show that decolonizing anthropology will involve much more than rethinking how the field poses the relationship between theory and practice. They're calling for a new politics of ethics, a politics of engagement, a politics of, of practice that doesn't only have the effect of consolidating power and knowledge in old ways. They are asking that we reconstruct with them a field in crisis, whether the metaphor is to let, to leave it to burn and reconstruct it from its ashes, or whether we interrupt anthropology's hegemonic inheritances with principles of practice that shape structures of engagement 
such a practice and a project will involve calling into question the institutional designs of university learning from syllabi production and teaching strategies to various forms of scientific quantification and metrics, funding practices, learning and sitting patterns, and thinking of evaluation methods that enable such work. I'm arguing that we unravel the institutional domains and scientific and unattuned modalities that structure our work, but also to see how our knowledge production is deeply imbricated within the political economy of the contemporary university. And of course, by extension, uh, a global political economy based fundamentally on social injustice and inequality. We apply as scholars, we apply for large grants, small grants, we publish, we award and the reproduction of particular metrics. Uh, we increase departmental citation indexes. We recruit and teach those whose credentials and scholarly logics are intelligible to our own. Anthro anthropology will never be decolonized by efforts built only within the walls of our Northern institutions and by one or two individual efforts so long as there's an absence of concerted new principles and regimes of reproduction styled to auto replicate. We need a critically engaged, we need critically engaged scholars committed to a new pedagogy, but also willing to recognize that decolonizing anthropology is actually part of a wicked structural problem. It's a multi-headed hydra that is connected to larger questions of social injustice, poverty, global effects of, of climate change, and of course the afterlife of imperial conquest and its continuing settler reconscriptions on daily lives and livelihoods. So in, in addressing one aspect of this multi-headed hydra, I'll, I'll wrap up my concluding remarks um, by just highlighting particular engaged practices that, that I've been working on with a growing consortium of colleagues um, and who are delineating new principles for rebuilding anthropological practice from the ground up. And as part of this work, and as part of a response to can, anthrop can we decolonize anthropology, we've been responding to the question, what new principles does a commitment to radical humanism in anthropology require? How can we reshape our ethical commitments by providing a new roadmap that consolidates our commitments while also remaking the story of the discipline? So by developing a new roadmap that takes root through radical commitments to a different form of practice in anthropology, we can take steps toward transforming knowledge practices through ethnographic practice and through the, the principles to which we commit. We can reshape its hiring practices, its representational presence, the forms of knowledge and legible and illegible, its institutional commitments, including universities, funding agencies, uh, what kinds of texts are published, its evaluative, evaluative measures, and the state of university policies that shape graduate student admissions. We can also develop ways to amplify knowledge produced outside of the universities and, and research policy centers on its own terms. So domains of anthropological knowledge then are certainly interrelated with political economic challenges in our world. And I've certainly spent a lot of my, my academic career writing about this, and I'm not focusing on this today, but I'll spend the, 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 the final few minutes um, just uh, highlighting uh, th those seven principles that are central to the work that we've been doing. And we can uh, certainly um, discuss them more in depth. And I think they're very much related to the, the questions that will emerge uh, from the discussion. Um, uh, earlier, so to mention Deborah Thomas, who has been part of this work um, with input from some students at Indiana University, as well as um, two students at the University of Toronto, Nick Smith and Diana L. Ricciani, um, with the support of the Winter Grant Foundation and Sapiens. Uh, so let me just um, show the principles. I don't really have time for a full uh, discussion of them, but, but hopefully you can see the, the principles and the um, 
the 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 question in in thinking about these principles of practice that that are part of this multi-headed hydra that that requires engagement and interruption um, it, it calls for a departure from a subject object relationship or an assistant an insistence that cultural transformations depart from universalizing trends that omit particularities and difference and instead involves an engagement with different methods and practices um, that exceed written and linear progressions of the world around us. Um, so if, if we just fast forward to the principles, so draft principle one, and they're called draft principles because uh, they're part of multi, uh, a multi-year set of discussions, debates, engagements um, that, that will be happening soon online through debate formats and, and through a conference. Uh, but the first draft principle speaks to a commitment to a method of attunement through which we form relationships with others. Um, that the second draft principle is about a commitment toward moving beyond a conceptualization of a liberal subject in the field that is knowable and reducible to cultural units and ethnographic data. The third principle has to do with a, com a commitment to forms of reasoning that involve abduction, including multiscalar analysis that highlight relationships among cultural processes. So not induction or deduction, but abduction, which we can talk about later as well. Um, the fourth princ draft principle is a commitment to understanding humans on their own terms and amplifying and clarifying their own theoretical knowledge, even as we attempt to understand our own. Here, it's not just one directive. We worked with, with different kinds of, of interlocutors with different political commitments. So the extent to which amplifying their political position or simply clarifying their world logics um, is, is part of the, the, the project depends on uh, a whole set of things related to who the ethnographer is and what the politics of, are of those who, to which we are engaging. Um, the draft principle six, I mean five, uh, has to do with a commitment to centering people's lived experience rather than over-representing the centrality of quantification. So that speaks to uh, the, the, the place of um, science in our discipline, but um, thinking critically about how quantification helps to amplify complex processes at a meso or meta level, but, but also calls on us to think about the, how everyday lived experiences lead that relation to quantification and the, the ways that a, these lived experiences can be obscured through that quantification. Um, draft principle six speaks to a commitment to humanism as an ethics of practice, uh, equality and difference. And of course, it includes a recognition of the ways that humans and more than humans are actually entangled. And then draft principle seven, uh, speaks to the commitment to accountability to the communities with whom we work and the communities that surround our institutional spaces, cities, regions. Um, and here, accountability isn't simply just sending the trophy book or the trophy article and, you know, talking about it or translating it. Accountability involves a different and, and more complex set of engaged practices that that are negotiated. Um, and if we go back to some of the early principles of attunement and, and other core, core and important components of engagement, um, that in many ways shapes the, 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 the way that one might uh, approach questions of accountability depending on those with whom we work. And so, um, so as I've said, as individual principles, there uh, many parts of them are not new. They um, they resound in in the, the work of decolonizing anthropology over the the generation. But when consolidated, they amplify new sets of commitments that, when put together, um, suggest that we consider a, a form of practice that's part of this multi-headed hydra that. Um, that we engage, that we think through, that if anthropology is going to continue its work and if we uh, continue to work within these institutions, that we also take a stand on um, questions that 
are contrary to the direction of the neoliberal university uh, and that that involve complex and, and difficult um, uh, positions uh, that that really are part of the fodder, fodder of this discussion. But I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. And uh, I know my, my colleague uh, Ryan is uh, on next and, and certainly we'll have time to talk further about this as well as uh, other comments related to the article. Thank you. So I'll essentially pick up where Kamari has left us. And of course, Kamari, I'm you know thankful to have you as a colleague. I was also once your student. So this is a very special occasion to be here. Um, in conversation with you all. Um, again, I want to thank the organizers. I would have loved to have been in Oslo with you all today, but instead I'm up early this morning in Chicago. Um, but at least we have the, the snow that makes it feel like I'm actually a bit closer to you all this morning. Um, but I guess I want to pick up on what Kamari was raising about decolonizing anthropology as moving away from sort of a discourse of individual failures or failings um, to a broader structural project um, of abolition or decolonization that necessarily um, reaches beyond the university. So I was just sort of meditating on the framing of our conversation for today um, on, you know, can anthropology be decolonized? Um, and I think that, um, you know, maybe I will defer offering a definitive answer to that query, but I really want to interrogate why that is our impulse or horizon. Why is it that we want to decolonize anthropology, which I think always gestures toward this sort of um, impulse toward fixes um, or sort of an attention to the kinds of individual failures that Kamari is describing. So why is our politics not oriented necessarily toward a broader um, sort of consideration of what decolonization or in other theaters abolition might be um, but always focused or routed back into the discipline to um, anthropology and its capacity to be decolonized. I want to sit with that. Um, I'm going to offer a few comments about um, the inspiration for the essay that I wrote in 2020, um, The Case for Letting Anthropology Burn. And I've discussed this quite a bit in, in other forms. So I'm going to try to avoid rehearsing um, the entire sort of inspiration for this um, that emerged out of the 2018 AAAs in San Jose, um, and particularly sort of the presence of um, the wildfires in California, the smoke that was engulfing the conference center. Um, but I actually wanna call attention to another anecdote that I have not discussed in relation to this piece um, that perhaps better contextualizes my thinking um, at the time that I began formally writing the essay in the summer months of 2019. Um, so actually that, that August of 2019, um, and I remember I was um, reviewing uh, much of the literature published by anthropologists um, to date, um, in, the, in the year to date, um, I was also conducting supplemental field research for my book manuscripts um, on the history and politics of the oil and gas industry in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I was actually staying at a, a mutual friend's house in Port of Spain that Kamari also knows quite well. Um, and I remember on the afternoon of August 24th, I received a banner notification um, from the Weather Channel app um, on my iPhone. Um, and the summary, you know, in, in short, explained that a tropical depression had formed in the Atlantic Ocean about 805 miles east, southeast of Barbados. And of course, this didn't necessarily raise any immediate cause for concern um, because Trinidad sits outside of the, the typical Caribbean hurricane belt. It's very rarely affected by major um, storms of that variety. Um, but I couldn't help at that moment thinking about the devastation of the hurricanes Irma and Maria uh, just a year prior. Um, and I, there was a kind of nervous, um, nervous energy, I think that it was associated with that moment when the notification came um, across my phone. So. Later that evening, of course, the, the depression was upgraded to a tropical storm with sustained winds of greater than 35 knots. Um, and after the, the winds crossed this threshold that actually received a name from the, the National um, Weather Service, and that name um, was Dorian. Um, and I don't need to repeat here what we all know about the fate of this particular storm. Um, by September 1st, Hurricane Dorian made landfall on Great Abaco Island in the Bahamas. Um, with winds in excess of 185 miles an hour. 
Um, the islands of Abaco and Grand bah Bahamas sustained Category 5 winds for more than 22 hours. And of course, countless lives were lost here, many of whom you know, belong to the often sort of vilified Haitian migrant community in the Bahamas. Um, and many of them subsequently were threatened with deportation um, after the devastation of the storm. Um, so weighing this devastation against the experience of the AAAs the previous November, in which the climate crisis was very differently apprehended as a kind of interruption in the normal order of things, perhaps the you know a harbinger of a crisis um, not yet realized or yet to come, rather than the fatal realities of a climate collapse already underway in the present, really pressed me to reckon with what I saw as a persistent conceit in our discipline, you know, namely this imperative to place our objects of critique, um, or perhaps our, the geographies of crisis um, at a certain kind of distance while preserving um, at all costs a sort of normative order of things, both within the university and spaces of professional reproduction, you know, like the AAAs and our conferences, even conversations like this one. And this isn't to say that um, there's sort of a strict um, division between the sort of geographies of the metropole or of the United States and the global south, because there are sort of many souths even within those geographies. But for whatever reason, it became very difficult for us to apprehend that as something that was sort of that was imminent, that was intimate, um, that, that pervaded um, our professional spaces um, and sites of knowledge production. Um, so in other words, I guess I'm thinking through here is sort of why anthropologists are so comfortable, we as anthropologists are so comfortable and successful at documenting the sort of devastating and often fatal realities of anthropogenic climate change and other kinds of um, crises and certain theaters that are deemed distant or peripheral from our places of work, um, but still find it often so troubling or difficult to reckon with the very same phenomena as sort of necessitating or inaugurating a transformation of our existing modalities of professional life and, and knowledge production. Um, so really, I was trying to put together um, a, a critique that uh, permits a frame in which Hurricane Dorian and the wildfires of California were not just sort of comparable um, or analogous, um, but were sort of deeply genealogically linked by the afterlives of you know, chattel slavery and settler colonialism. So just to, to point out, um, it's, it's not simply my own um, Jamaican national chauvinism that led to the, the choice of Peter Tosh as an epigraph um, for the case for letting anthropology burn. It was actually quite intentional to think about um, where these critiques emanate from and often how the sort of vernacular knowledges that emanate from the very theaters in which we conduct our research are often um, you know, a uh, sideline by anthropological discourse. Uh, so this is where the, you know, the conversation about what we build or rebuild under the banner of anthropology or whether we rebuild under the banner of anthropology, I think is um, so crucial. Um, so to this end, I think, you know, inhabiting the, the passive voice of letting anthropology burn has been very important for me that this is not, or it doesn't need to be an effort to dismantle. Um, it's more so a refusal to rehabilitate anthropology um, and its sort of signature objects of study, our, our sort of existing modalities and analytics um, element of crisis, which I think is only accelerated um, under COVID-19 and sort of many other sort of adverse circumstances that, you know, for instance, as we train students, make it very difficult for us to follow the regular rhythms and contours um, of anthropological research. Um, I think what's really been fascinating to me is the way that this essay has experienced um, a second and perhaps even a third life of sorts as we, um, as these different manifold crises um, mount upon each other. Um, so, you know, it's being read now in this moment of COVID-19, um, of insurgent protest against state violence and, and white supremacist vigilantism. Um, and also of specifically the, the counterpunch of white supremacist violence that engulfed the Capitol in Washington, D.C. in January. Um, and I think that that was actually just another sort of um, telling moment um, where, again, it became urgently clear that the, the liberal anti-racist discourse that um, lies at the heart of much of um, sort of anthropological critique, um, you know, one that rests 
outside of or as an exception to, you know, the, the apocalypse of settler colonialism and white supremacy um, really failed us at that moment, it failed to lend us the necessary tools to anticipate, to diagnose, um, or to respond swiftly and expediently to the white supremacist insurrection at the Capitol beyond pleas for, you know, a return to normalcy um, and a status quo of sort of liberal state violence and carcerality and surveillance. Um, so again, I think I'm indebted um, in this regard to, to Rolf Trio um, and particularly his essay, um, A New Culture, um, where he talks about sort of the, the way the culture concept began to enjoy um, a life outside of its conditions of origin in the field of anthropology. And I think, again, um, and I've, I've said this in, in other venues, you know, whether we currently are its chief adherents or not, this liberal discourse of anti-racism, which we've seen sort of have a, um, a, a vibrant life in, in sort of popular um, literature and in the, in the New York Times and other sort of book lists um, and is also spearheaded or originated by many anthropologists now enjoys a, a life of its own beyond our discipline and beyond the academy that we have to be deeply attentive to. Um, so not only is it incumbent upon us to you know, be attentive and vocal about its limits um, and what it does or does not do in the world. Um, I think we, we have to think about sort of where our commitments lie. Um, are we committed to a politics of abolition um, against capital, against the police state, against the military industrial complex? Or are we committed to stabilizing an existing order of things through a sort of ritual rehearsal of these you know, progressive or anti-racist platitudes? Um, so maybe to just offer some thoughts as to what anthropology or perhaps anthropologists and perhaps disentangling the two might be helpful um, can do or become in this moment. I think uh, TRIO is really instructive again um, because it was very clear that the project of the West um, as a project and not a place um, or of Western liberal humanism um, always emanates from the construction of a, a savage slot, of a savage, illiberal, um, sort of crisis engulfed other. Um, and I think exploding the savage slot, which is an unfinished project, despite the fact that I think we, we all sort of teach and, and dwell with that essay so often, um, requires that we build an anthropology that is a lot you know, decidedly more capacious um, in its scope and method, um, and one that attends to the enduring violences of the present um, in sort of close dialogue with the colonial histories of violence that produced our present genre of the human. Um, and that's to you know, invoke Sylvia Winter. And I think this is precisely um, some of the, uh, the directives that Kamari is, is lending us, um, perhaps pu push us in that direction in extremely productive ways. Um, so again, to ground this in sort of my own genealogy as a scholar of the Caribbean, as a Caribbean person, um, uh, I, I want to invoke uh, my colleague Jerry Marbonia again and sort of her insistence that um, this method really just amounts to what she calls being a good Caribbeanist. Um, since you know we've always understood there's no way to apprehend um, our world and again it's it's manifold crises except um, in the afterlives of slavery um, and the plantation complex. That that's precisely where. Um, the limits of the human, of where liberal humanism was drawn. And I think that that actually needs to be, um, need to be even more committed to returning to that, that moment and that theater um, as a site for the, the development of our, our theory and critique. Um, so really I'm just, at, I guess I'm, I'm posing the question um, perhaps to myself, perhaps to the group of, you know, what kind of anthropology it would require to, you know, sufficiently dismantle Trio's savage slot um, to eclipse um, what Winter calls the, the present genre of the human or what she calls elsewhere the, the overrepresentation of man as the human. Um, and, you know, to begin, I think it's, you know, it, it has to be an anthropology that is far less confident and assured in its own brand of humanism. Um, you know, one that I think failed to articulate the genealogical linkages between the California wildfires and the devastation of Dorian in Abaco and Grand Bahama. Um, and one I think that also proved sort of insufficient to the task of 
meeting the threat of the, the melee at the Capitol um, in Washington, D.C. in January. So I really want to sort of sit with those limits um, and perhaps, you know, think with you all about the kinds of methods, um, the kinds of theory that might actually be up to the task. So I'll just leave it there now as we open up um, for discussion. So over to you, uh, Michelle uh, Tistel. Uh, let me also uh, uh, announce here and now that there's, uh, you know, when the panel has concluded its uh, questioning of, of professors uh, Clark and, and Jobson, we will open uh, the floor for, for discussions via uh, the Q&A function from, from the audience. Um, but, but first now to Michelle Tipsel, uh, who's a uh, graduate, a PhD graduate of, of Harvard University and uh, senior research librarian at the National Library of Oslo, uh, of Norway in Oslo. Thanks very much, Sandra, and thanks everybody. I'm very um, honored to be invited to this esteemed uh, event. I've followed several of your events in the past, and it's a, it's a pleasure to join you today. Um, I'd, I would like to preface my question um, uh, because it's a, a bit different than the other questions that have been sent in, and I'm happy that we start with my question because it's a little bit different than the others. However, I'm very relieved by both presentations because I see that it is more relevant than I originally had uh, considered it. So I was very, very pleased to see the, um, the draft principles, um, which uh, allowed me to be a bit more confident in, in actual direction of my questions, because I think uh, the questions uh, that I want to raise really go to the heart of um, um, questioning and looking for new principles. Um, and my question looks both inward to uh, the discipline and our own practices, our own rehearsals, our own rituals, our own ways of um, reproducing structures and power structures within the discipline of anthropology, but also looks outward at the way we conceive of our subjects and we uh, perceive ourselves as being, you know, the uh, knowers, best knowers of, of humans um, compared to uh, other, other disciplines. Um, and it also goes to the heart of, I think, um, if, when, when we talk about establishing new principles, one that I'm very concerned with is how we communicate with the outside world um, uh, as well. So these are all concerns that I have. Um, so the question that I have, um, uh, the questions I have are for Kamari, if I may address you as Kamari. Um, and they have to do with, um, I'll just read them so that they become a little more intelligible for everyone, let's see. Um, in, in your uh, 2010 article, um, your discuss discussion of critically engaged ethnographic practice was very, uh, very invigorating and particularly in relation to ways of thinking about serving the public domain. And reading about the ethical dilemmas of practice and forms of engagement um, led me to think a lot about the broader discussions about the applications of ethnography and, and applications of anthropological knowledge and there's distinctions between scholarly and applied anthropological practice, um, which has plagued the discipline for so long. Um, and you note that, the, that most cultural anthropologists have sought to understand structures of power without significantly intervening in the substance of study. And of course, this is, uh, as, you, as you note, this is true for some anthropologists, but not for all. Uh, for anthropologists such as myself, who are dedicated to different forms of engagement labeled applied anthropology. Um, that, that is of course not, not the case. So I'm, I'm very um, interested in where the so-called applied anthropologist um, fits into the dis discussion of the future of the discipline and the establishment of the new principles and particularly um, the need to carve out new domains of engagement and praxis and particularly in relation to this question of whether we should allow anthropology to burn or not and how to decolonize it. Um, I feel that there might be a, a, a very unique role for applied anthropologists or for people who um, have been working uh, in, in, in a very engaged way. So that's, 
that's um, my first uh, question. Shall I read the second one or would you like to address, address the first question? Uh, for the, is that my decision? Yeah, it is your decision. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, sure. I'll, I'll address it. Is the second question for me or for? It's for you as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, why don't you read the second then? And I can just take both of them because I'm okay. also conscious of time. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, my second question uh, has more to do with how we conceive of our, our subjects and the communities that we engage with. And um, um, yeah, your assessment of the benefits of learning multiple field languages, such as law, medicine, science, and business, as a way of identifying new forms of praxis and strengthening the relevance and influence of ethnography is also very compelling. Um, and it sounds like you're saying, or you were saying uh, in the article that anthropology can be become more relevant by becoming more um, multidisciplinary, to use a very boring term. Um, but increasingly, I see evidence that uh, for example, evolutionary biology and neuroscience can have implications for ethnography, particularly how anthropology should relate to notions of free will, agency, and even the nature of thought and cognition, um, what people say and do. And have you considered um, as part of the new principles, and I see traces of it, I see ways of uh, attaching it to um, the the draft, the drafts, uh, draft principles that you presented. So I'm very pleased about that. But I wanted to still ask if you see, um, have you considered how these concerns might change the practice of ethnography and you know the relevance of the data we we collect? Whether this should be a matter of ethical consideration for anthropology anthropologists, uh, because it's a pressing concern for me. I feel uh, more and more that other disciplines are challenging the very nature of what we do and the type of data. Uh, we collect and the kind of analysis that we have relied on for so long. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Michelle, for, for those two great questions. I had to go back to, to that piece and, um, and also think about the, the demons I was wrestling with inside at the time of its writing, in fact. You know, who was I in conversation with? What were the issues? And as you could see in, in that piece, I start with the problematic that I was called by the US um, Department of State uh, to engage and on a number of occasions. Also, when I was the chair of African studies at Yale, there was um, in some capacity in my, in my chairship, I was engaged with um, some of the, the subgroups that are uh, doing work on Africa and, for, and African foreign policy, especially at the time as it relate, related to AFRICOM and the, the, the dire challenges around militarization in, 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 in these regions. And now looking at it some 10, even 13, 14 years later, it has had severe consequences in, in these regions. And I guess one of the questions is um, whether I was there whether I wasn't there, did it make a difference with the, the nature of US foreign policy? It was much, much bigger than one or two or three people who are anthropologists in, engaging certainly. But the, the problematic at the time um, had to do with um, the, and, and part of what I was charting was the extent to which anthropological field language shouldn't simply be understood through linguistic categories that we learn Yoruba or that we learn Spanish or that we learn um, field languages in these sites, but that we take seriously the, the need to understand these other disciplinary domains, whether it's um, the, the, it involves uh, studying law or studying science or neuroscience and subjecting oneself to the actual rudimentation of, um, of this kind of technocratic knowledge uh, so that we're not simply observing these processes at a distance without understanding the embodied knowledge that becomes part of the training. And, and so in part, the, the commitment um, in relation to how we conceive of and, and think about anthropological engagements was my early interested in questions of attunement. What does it look like? And what does it look like with even particular troubling field sites, you know, in, in cases where we were working in, in post-war zones or in, in very difficult um, 
situations of dire need and and stress and uh, the in the aftermath of violence and you know what does it mean to do a work and I think that to do work there and Ryan really hit the nail on the head when um, thinking about the kind of um, drama ethnography where you know like a reporter people run to sites of of crisis in in an attempt to to produce fodder for anthropological thought. Um, in, in, in terms of anthropology's ethical principles, that's perfectly allowable. In terms of a, a new ethic, ethics through which we do the work we do, um, how do we reconcile the, the attempts to produce these domains of, of knowledge that become the fodder for anthropological thought in the midst of an absolute distress? Um, and instead, would our method of attunement enable a different form of engagement? And I see, I think we see that um, loud and clear in the intimacies of COVID-19 and the, the ways that it's impacting everyday life for all of us in every way, um, and some far more than others, um, but, but there's no one that isn't affected by this crisis. And so, um, so yeah, the, so to the second question, it really is about thinking about early methods, my early attempts to think about methods of attunement, the logics, the kind of subjection of, of, of technocratic knowledge that are necessary. Um, it's not just what we observe in the matter of fieldwork, but it's how we understand the logic of its training and what that means for the, our in, engagement with um, the products of, of that work. So the second question, um, I, I think wh what I would say is that m our, our, our interest here uh, and my interest here is not to reify the division between applied and engaged anthropology. And I think that's part of the problem um, actually. And that, you know, these distinctions aren't, aren't useful i mean they are they're, they're useful in the sense that many of us come of age with these categories right um you know you're a legal anthropologist or you might be a cultural critic or you might be a whole range of things because our institutions need to render us legible and and justify the nature of our existence in these places and the reality is that so many of us do so many things and participate and wear different hats for different purposes we're we're theory theoreticians and and we do engage work we do a lot of work and they're all interrelated there's no fundamental line between and amongst them so and, and what's interesting about the emergence of the the engaged turn in in anthropology by the the 21st century is the way that engagement then became an ex, an acceptable way of of talking about a more sophisticated form of applied um, uh, policy work or uh, applied work. Um, so that division, and you know, I, I welcome your your responses to that. But I think that there are sets of contradictions at play: the legibility of our 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 identities and the categories that we see ourselves fulfilling and our training histories. Uh, but but also, where does it get us to to make the division? And what what I'm interested here, and you know, some 12 years after that article toward a gay, engaged anthropological practice, is is rethinking um, an, an analytic base that presumes the scientific quantification as the only way to understand um, anthropological and ethnographic and engaged work. And I can say a lot more about that, but the but but I think that the, the 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 way to go is to actually think about our our engagement, our complicity, our the the extent of inaction, and um, and and what it means, and to subject it to not to say that every everyone has to you know mobilize and um, you know cross borders to to do uh, political work, but it it but it it also means that we subject ourselves to questions about the the nature of our relationships with others and and what um, a disaggregation of that engagement means or the the, the lack of um, engagement in particular ways the silences that that can very well be fully justified but that also need to be in, interrogated and because we we choose our battles we determine what we we do why and and when 
So I'll, I'll stop there in the interest of time um, and happy to pick it up again if, if, if you'd like. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Kamari. I, uh, I have a question for for uh, Ryan. Um, so, in in this uh, twenty twenty essay, uh, the case for letting anthropology burn, uh, the inspiration is clearly uh, Mike Davis' uh, essay. Uh, which was published in the in the context of these uh, California wildfires, which we both uh, experienced as attendees at this uh, uh, annual meeting of the American Anthropological Association in San Jose, California. Um, but you hear describe um, what uh, that letting anthropology burn would mean in terms of. Uh, to let anthropology burn, then, is to refuse a uh, fictive separation of anthropology as a space of bourgeois academic work from the material histories of other fields uh, that uh, shape that took shape alongside the forma uh, formation of other sciences. Uh, the sense of an e ecological and, and human crisis is, of course, fundamental to modern anthropology itself um, and has been you know central for a very long long time and I'm thinking here of, of, of an early popular work such as Evistro's Christ Kopik right from the 1930s already um, and the my, you also refer to the demise of the West as a political and intellectual project and the fading horizons of the post-World War II uh, liberal settlement. Um, and, and this, I think, is by and large become an accepted fact way beyond the confines of our own discipline of anthropology. Uh, but I, 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 I'm going to call for a bit of concreteness in terms of uh, what uh, the very abandonment of an anthropology uh, committed to its own exceptionalism and the charting of ways um, anchored in, in radical humanism and abolitionist anthropology might possibly entail. Certainly. Thank you, Sinjar. Um, I'll do my best to, to answer, I think, what is a very sort of crucial and multifaceted question. Um, and I think, you know, in some respects, you, you've answered it yourself in that these critiques, you know, of the West, of liberal humanism actually are thriving um, beyond the borders of the university, beyond our own discipline. Um, so again, I think that I'm arguing against the exceptionalism of anthropology, against um, sort of our certainty or self-assuredness um, that we are sort of the vanguard of this critique. Um, I think I'm asking for anthropologists, including myself, um, to engage in a bit more sort of humility vis-a-vis -vis these, these conversations and objects. And I think that, you know, perhaps I'm less sanguine than you are about this moment signaling sort of the the demise of the West as we know it as a political and, you know, um, an intellectual project. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about sort of what was revealed by the kind of zeitgeist of Trump and Brexit, if we were sort of going to, if we were going to embark on a kind of postmortem analysis of those, those conjunctures, specifically the 2016 election in the US um, and sort of the, the Brexit referendum um, in the UK. And, um, my sense is that we may be seeing sort of a shift in the, the sort of dominant theaters of capital sort of, um, you know, and I, I think that I'm perhaps less optimistic than some before me, some sort of decolonial scholars who have saw, you know, the kind of um, the formation of the, the BRICS economic bloc um, as some kind of liberatory alternative um, to Western capital. And this is where I come back to Trio. Um, if we understand the West to be a project and not a place, um, again, sort of the Janus-faced other of the savage slot, 
um, simply shifting the location of that project, simply shifting the location or pluralizing the location of the sort of um, accumulation of capital, I think does not actually get us out of the, you know, the deeply sort of problematic, um, you know, project that the West poses. Um, so I'm really, at, you know, to, to put a finer point on your question about what does anthropology do in this moment? How does it actually sort of rise out of its own exceptionalism? Um, one thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I, I didn't use, I only use the term radical humanism as a placeholder um, in the abstract of my article. Um, and in the body of the essay, I quite deliberately use or, or employ the, the term new humanism in its, you know, various Fanonian um, and Winterian guises. Um, and I think that it signals a very particular kind of project, which is, you know, a new humanism is not simply a shift in orientation or a shift in discourse um, or a pluralizing of the human to include um, a sort of uh, greater and greater swath of, um, you know, of, uh, of homo sapiens, um, but it's the material abolition um, of the human as we know it, the explosion of the current genre of the human that requires a, a deeply material confrontation with white supremacy, not in these sort of after the fact post-mortem analyses of Trump or Brexit, um, you know, but as histories that pervade every facet of social and political life from the 16th century forward. So I think I want to sort of approach Trump and Brexit, not as sort of exceptional moments, um, but as quite mundane moments um, in sort of the centuries long elaboration of um, colonialism and white supremacy. Um, so yeah, what is, you know, what is this recognition perhaps of Trump or Brexit as a sort of harbinger of the, the demise of the West, you know, meant for anthropology? You know, have, has it actually shifted our methods of research, our analytical frameworks, our venues of publication, um, the sort of scope or extent of the forms that we're able to host under the banner of anthropology. Um, and I think that, you know, what I will say is that I think many anthropologists um, have proved that they are truly up to this task. You know, they're engaging directly with the liberation movements um, of the present. And I think that's something that we've seen throughout the history of anthropology. We have figures like you know, Eduardo Mondlane, who were deeply enmeshed. In fact, he, he left anthropology in order to serve sort of the liberation movement um, in Mozambique. So I, I think about figures like that quite a lot. Um, I think what I'm arguing is that in many respects, their efforts to place themselves in service of the project of liberation um, has often been in spite of anthropology and its enduring preoccupations rather than due to those same preoccupations. Like I really sort of shudder to think what it would have meant if Eduardo Manlin chose anthropology over Frelimo, for instance. Um, so I think, you know, in, in very sort of straightforward terms, um, you know, and perhaps I'm, I'm again sort of revealing myself to be um, uh, a, a classical Marxist here, um, but really I'm calling for a kind of project of turning anthropology on its head or turning it right side up um, in the sense that the current sort of formulation of anthropology that we've inherited um, is sort of deeply Hegelian um, in, its, in its aspirations. It aspires to a kind of discursive critique um, of the human, or as, as I've called earlier, a pluralizing of the human. Um, and I think, you know, again, the, the um, anthropologists, you know, have only studied the world, but the point is to change it. Um, that requires a completely different sort of set of preoccupations and values. Um, and perhaps to Michelle's point, um, it, it requires sort of an, an expanded understanding of what applied research is, or sort of the, the explosion of a false separation between applied and theoretical research. Um, and maybe this actually to, to connect back to the, the previous question as well. Um, I think it also requires that we be more capacious in our understanding of what applied work is. Um, sometimes that's confined a bit too much to this notion of advising um, sort of state bureaucracies or NGOs or other sort of formal liberal institutions, um, where, whereas applied work can mean um, a, a host of other things of, you know, organizations that are not formally recognized, um, different sort of clandestine networks um, of, of insurgents. 
Um, and I think that that's actually quite crucial for us to think about what does a, a genuinely applied anthropology look like that isn't already defined by the limited parameters um, of liberal political discourse. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Can I, can I come in with a, a point or? Uh, yeah, sure, Kamari. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to return us to the temporality of the question um, and Ryan's comments uh, really made me think that it's, it's worth further clarification as well, that, um, that, that there's a fundamental contradiction that, that of course is, is at play that we struggle with all the time, especially those of us working within um, various anthropological departments or units uh, that on one hand, um, the, we're, we're trying in tirelessly to, to work on institutional rethinking, uh, restructuring reform, different admissions processes, different methods. It, it doesn't mean that that's the end or that the, the master's tools will allow us to, to deconstruct the master's house, but it's, it's you know, to, to ask the question, what roles and what ways do we continue to be complicit in our evaluation schemes and in the, the ways that we do the work and teach uh, what we do and toward what end. So the transformation of particular practices is a form of praxis to which people may commit. Um, those forms of praxis can very much lead to other things that in the sort of the long durée of education um, in these institutions, what that looks like, we don't know what that leads to. It can lead to its own implosion. Um, you know, and I, I'm thinking of my colleague reminding me of Chantal Moss' um, work on the democratic paradox and the, you know, the very tools of interrogation and rethinking are the very tools that can lead to it. Um, disassembling. Um, in, in the same way, what anthropology will look like in 2050, uh, what, what scholarly education will look like post-COVID-19 in our universities, the online modalities and other forms of efficiencies that, that universities may very well engage in um, because we've already put in place a habitus of, of online work from, from home. What does that look like? And so I, I just want to um, emphasize that, you know, even as we talk about what we can do now within our, the, the places that we embody and the troubling spaces that we continue to, 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 to change and reform and to rethink um, as a form of praxis, uh, it doesn't mean that that's the stopping place. And, and I think that we need, we need to be open to that, that we need to be open to the, the realization that those practices can very well lead to other things that produce other things. And, and that it, it, certainly the draft principles uh, take that in mind. It's not a, an attempt for reform, but it's an attempt to say what we do now here matters. And it, it also matters in the ways that we redefine our anthropological futures. Those futures might become something else. So then, uh, Mumita? Uh, I think that uh, maybe Soraya should go first. I can come in, yeah. Okay, Soraya, you go first. Let me unmute. Hello, everyone. I'm Soraya. Um, I wanted to let you know that I'm actually geographically closer to you guys than you think. I'm in Detroit, so in the Midwest. Um, now, Kamari and Ryan, this is actually for both of you. Uh, you touched a little bit about it in your introductions. Um, but I suppose I would like you to answer explicitly about the following. Um, it's been about 30 years uh, since Harrison called for the decolonization of anthropology. And you know, reading both of your similar call to arms, uh, we're, it seems us are in agreement that we have a long way to go, right? I'm just wondering if this particular move to let um, Brian, as you say, anthropology burn, hasn't already been suggested as urgent by scholars outside the field many times. I'm thinking of the kinds of discussions that have come 
in particular out of Middle Eastern studies, post-colonial studies through the conversations that were generated by Edward Said's work, Talal Assad's work, Spivak, right? Um, Amal Amire, um, Marnia Lazaric, who wrote uh, Decolonizing Feminisms. Has it mattered to any of your work um, that these scholars have previously called for radical humanism explicitly, or even that anthropology should burn in some form, yet their, these interlocutors, their reach and their audiences are typically outside the North American institutional machinery and sociopolitical context. So in some cases, the draft principles that you have drawn up for reform or redefinition, in your opinion, is that only relevant to the US AAA and their audience? If you can respond to that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure, I can jump in on that. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that, you know, I, I agree precisely, you know, that I, I make no claims to the novelty of the argument that I'm making. Um, and I think even within our field or perhaps some sort of iconoclastic figures within the field like um, Bernard Magabane, um, you know, has sort of long gestured to very sort of similar demands on the field. I think you know, just as I wrote in, in 2016, when I, when I wrote a previous article with Jafari Allen um, on the decolonizing generation, um, part of the trouble is that if, if we as anthropologists had fully heeded the kind of decolonizing critiques of Faye Harrison, Ted Gordon and their interlocutors, um, you know, Jafari and I would have had no reason to write our essay in the first place. And I think the same, um, you know, goes for this essay um, on the, the case for letting anthropology burn. Um, in part, it's only a result of, um, again, the sort of suppression of the very timely critiques um, of folks like Magumani and Faris um, in their, their essay on the political relevance of anthropology um, that necessitated um, sort of my, my efforts to um, redouble their critique. Um, so, so yes, um, not only within anthropology, but in, um, in general, the, 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 again, my framework that I, that I invoke of, the, of new humanism is not mine, it's, it's Fanon's, it's, it's Sylvia Winters. Um, and I think actually a, a, an example like Spivak is very telling. I'm not sure that she's taken up more outside of the North American Academy, um, but I think that she would argue that sort of the, the ethnographic impulse, the sort of anthropological mandate to give voice to the voiceless is deeply, deeply misguided, right? Um, so I think that there's actually something there um, that we haven't fully grappled with. And I, you know, if you read a number of ethnographies where they actually cite Spivak against her own intentions to say that, you know, you can, if you listen close enough, then you can hear the subaltern speak. Well, that's not the point of, of her article. It's actually precisely um, the opposite. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, similarly, if, if anthropologists, if we had truly reckoned with Fanon and Winter, for instance, um, and insisted on crafting a study of the human that takes, you know, man in its Winterian terms as an object of critique, rather than a structure again to pluralize or diversify, um, I would have had very, very little reason to write this, this essay. And I'm actually really encouraged when some colleagues read my essay and say that it, it, it reads to them as sort of passe or obvious, because it means that they're already initiated, they're already engaged in this practice of letting anthropology burn. Um, but what I've been assured by many of these colleagues, you know, though, is that the essay was also deeply necessary and perhaps brought a number of these kind of unspoken anxieties or predicaments to the surface. Um, but again, now that we, now we can discuss in a public forum um, like this one. So certainly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that my work is derivative of Fanon or, and Winter or Faye Harrison for that matter, precisely because their project um, of a new human, humanism or of a decolonizing anthropology remains fundamentally incomplete. Um, and, you know, to my mind can only be realized through the abolition, you know, of structures of coloniality and capital um, and authority that stand between us and the kind of futures they imagine for us. Um, and, you know, to, I guess to, again, to put a pin on it, um, it is, of course, it's not only the, the AAAs or anthropologists in the United States or the North Atlantic 
um, that, that are enmeshed in this. Um, but I think that what I was tackling in the article was the, the sort of deeply ingrained chauvinism of those scholarly communities, um, often um, precisely their, their efforts to, to divorce themselves from scholarly currents um, that have taken hold elsewhere that, that are far more attentive um, to these critiques. Um, so, you know, of course, being in, you know, writing in the pages of American anthropologists, there was a clear sort of, um, sort of object of address that I had in mind. Um, but it's precisely because I was speaking to those who um, perhaps were not yet initiated into the, the literature that is commonplace. I mean, I'm, I have a PhD in Black studies as well as in, um, in anthropology. Um, in Black studies, this is quite commonplace. Um, and we're only seeing some of those conversations um, through the work of many sort of um, Black anthropologists and, and anthropologists of the African diaspora that it's actually sort of reaching um, sort of the, the summit of anthropological theory in a moment like today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have actually a question that uh, parallels one of our audience questions. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask mine and open the floor to our uh, attendees who've been waiting patiently to ask uh, their question. Um, it's uh, this question for both of you, but I'm referring more directly to uh, Professor Clark's uh, article. What was very important for me um, there was how, uh, uh, Professor Clark, you point to the need for reformulating disciplinary ethics to include the question of inequality in global politics, right? And I'm very grateful for the draft principles that you outlined today. These are very important and the discipline must engage with them. But I wonder how the discipline in other contexts, for example, let's say Western Europe, you think will deal with it. Um, as a global discipline, how far do you think the professional practitioners of anthropology are likely to negotiate or to engage with these principles and think about the question of disciplinary ethics with the politics of global inequality, Northern dominance and inequalities within the global South. So if we think about dominance as sort of extension of coloniality of power as economic, as social, as epistemological and so on. So that's the uh, question I have. And um, Virginia Dominguez also has a similar question. She writes that uh, she is from the Caribbean and she shares much of your concern. Um, she serves on the, I think this, uh, yeah. Um, and she serves on the board of the World Council of Anthropological Associations a network that now has over 50 member associations and the vast majority of them are not from the Caribbean, the US or Canada. There are, uh, yeah, there are many anthropologists there and around the world who are concerned with decolonizing anthropology in a broad, broader way. How do you think we can extend the issue beyond our Afro-European societies? Thank you. Great, uh, thank you for that. And uh, uh, thank you to Virginia as well, who. Um, whose work I've admired over the years. So it's great to hear, hear, hear her question. Um, and, and I can see the, the importance in that given the, the, the work that she's been doing tirelessly for many years with the Global Anthropologies Unit. Um, so, so where to start? Well, in the, obviously the draft principles are, speak directly to the problem with an anthropological ethics that is about the maintenance of science, the, the, the operating principles around which the science of anthropology uh, can proceed, around which our human subject clearance is viable, et cetera. I mean, that's the limit of, um, as, as well as a moral commitment, of course, but th there's a, um, a juridical framework through which the contemporary anthropological principles are articulated, as well as important moral considerations that have emerged from tireless work of, of our colleagues. Um, what the draft principles attempt to do, simply by way of thinking about anthropological practice, is, is to push for further commitment to, to some of the prevailing trends that have existed in, in, the, in the discipline that actually will continue to undermine a decolonizing effort. Um, and so uh, 
so so in terms of practice and praxis, there's something particular about draft principles that move from a juridical model um, that that instead take up much larger questions. But to uh, Virginia Dominguez's question about, I mean, really, it, it, it's about how do we move from here? Um, because everyday practice, wherever we're set, situated, will get us only so far. Um, if we're in the North, if we're elsewhere in the South or in the Caribbean, and, and Virginia, good for you for being in the Caribbean right now, if you are, um, and not in the cold. Uh, but wherever one is at, at this moment, um, of course, is, is important in, in how we think about our own subject position, where we are, what the political economies and, and, and institutional challenges within those spaces, um, economic challenges, challenges around climate change, et cetera. Um, and so what that calls for is a larger agenda that we move from individualizing anthropological practice in particular ways to thinking about its imbrication with these structures of inequality. And so earlier I talked about climate change and um, the, or the, 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 the kind of um, violence that, that is emergent that isn't unrelated to histories of, of colonial imperial power uh, and you know, extraction, um, economic extraction. Uh, it, it's not fundamentally related and shouldn't be relegated to the, the, the rubric of activist anthropology or uh, of uh, what was it that our colleague um, called it um, uh, in, beyond engaged anthropology, but applied anthropology, that, but that it's fundamental to the ways that we think about uh, a liberation politics it's fundamental to the ways that we think about knowledge production. If someone is hungry and struggling uh, in the aftermath of loss, um, how does a particular anthropological practice help without thinking about knowledge production under different conditions in which uh, the kind of plunder that's part of their everyday life makes us complicit in the things we enjoy in this life. And so um, there's no one formula. Regions are different. Complexities are different. The, the role of uh, the neoliberal uh, university and its impact is a multi-billion dollar industry that is, is profoundly critical. Uh, but this, but insisting that anthropological prax practice and praxis is part of the ways that we think about these political economies of inequality have to go hand in hand and have to continue to go hand in hand. Uh, and so really that's the point. And, you know, there's not one formula, but that we, um, I think this is the collaborative work. This is the, the, the work ahead. So I'll, I'll um, turn it to Ryan. He might have further thoughts about um, the, the marrying of prax praxis with the kind of political economies of extraction, for example. Mm -hmm. I guess I just I have a few thoughts about, again, I think many of the questions have been trying to push me towards sort of the, the practical conditions of the discipline and perhaps how we implement um, a project this sort of ambitious um, uh, around sort of letting anthropology burn. And I would say that there actually are a lot of very mundane ways in which we can implement this. So I'm thinking about the fact, you know, um, it's no surprise that since we just completed, um, you know, sort of our graduate admissions review this year at Chicago, um, that I'm always thinking about sort of how we um, not only select students, but how we mentor students, what are the values that we impart. Um, and I guess what I've realized over the past few years is that I have very little interest in training anthropologists. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in training students in my department to do critically engaged scholarship, to conduct ethnography. Um, I mean, similarly, I'm not very interested in training sociologists or economists um, for that matter. Um, that I, I'm really sort of motivated by um, sort of what are the urgent conditions of our time? Um, how can my students sort of best assemble a conceptual and political toolkit uh, to confront those realities. Um, and again, I think that um, I'm trying to sort of challenge the sort of dictates of the, the job market and push back against one that sort of values um, sort of solitary modalities of 
of field work um, and also a kind of extractive relationship to um, to our field sites. Um, you know, I think it's also about encouraging students to make um, sort of enduring linkages with um, with sort of intellectuals, with political actors, um, and and you know, working people in the places in which they conduct their research, and seeing that as as much of the process that we you know, if we're lucky enough to be funded by an anthropology department, either as sort of our um, as a place of study or place of employment. Um, to what ends are we actually sort of deploying those resources that we are sort of lucky enough to have access to? Um, so really, you know, to my mind, um, I think of examples like um, the Atlanta Sociological Laboratory that Du Bois um, led um, in, the, uh, in the sort of mid 20th century um, as a great example of this, as, as a deeply collaborative and creative um, sort of a research unit that was devoted to empirical social science, um, certainly, um, but was really sort of meeting problems head on, was thinking about creative ways to disseminate and represent their research. Um, and I also will say, you know, um, you know I, I don't want to, to overstate um, perhaps uh, how, how radical this other project has been because I didn't personally go through it. But when I, I, I admire my colleagues um, that were trained in the African diaspora program at UT Austin so very much. And I want to sort of um, note that the work that Ted Gordon did at that institution to train an entire generation um, of critical um, anthropolo anthropological scholars that, um, it, to my mind, um, are some of my best colleagues and are not necessarily driven by sort of anthropology with a capital A, but always by the question of, you know, what are the, the politics of the work? Um, and that's something I always joke that um, Jafari Allen, who previously was at UT Austin before he came to Yale and served as my uh, dissertation advisor, that he brought the Austin School uh, to New Haven. And I very, very proudly sort of wear that badge on my sleeve. So I think about those, those models. And again, I think it, it's a testament to um, certain sort of modes of mentorship that I, I was never pressured to, um, to articulate why I was anthropological enough, um, you know, perhaps peer reviewers will ask that question more often than my dissertation committee did, but I appreciated that freedom. Um, and to, to the point about, you know, uh, again, I appreciate, um, and it's always wonderful to see questions come in from the Caribbean, uh, again, a place very close to my heart in a number of ways. Um, but this is an example, you know, this past summer, um, you know, I found myself writing uh, a, a, seri a series of op-eds and commentaries with a colleague, um, Matthew Quest, for various publications in the region um, after uh, Mike Pompeo's diplomatic visits to Guyana and Suriname, um, and really trying to shed light on the sort of realities of extractive imperialism um, in the contemporary Caribbean. So. Um, also, thanks to a colleague at, at the University of Toronto, Alyssa Trotz, um, we were able to publish a column um, in the Stalbrook News in Guyana, um, in the sort of National Workers Union site in, uh, in Trinidad, in the Antigua Observer. Um, and I think, it, you know, it, it demonstrated to me that we as anthropologists were quite effective, you know, at doing this kind of public facing work. Um, when we allow ourselves to sort of shed our own chauvinism about the type of writing that, that counts, that sort of advances our careers in a very instrumental fashion. Um, and when we're more honest about our defense of the discipline as a means to an end, because I'm not, I'm not asking the University of Chicago to liquidate the Department of Anthropology um, because it's a condition of possibility for the kinds of work that I'm able to do, that I'm, that I'm able to allow my students to do. Um, but I think if we're honest about the fact that the sort of um, our efforts to defend anthropology are as much a way to preserve our livelihoods and those of our students as we write, as we organize, as we study among friends and, you know, and comrades within the ac academy and beyond, um, I think that opens up a whole sort of um, array of possibilities that perhaps um, we haven't fully entertained. Um, so, so, yeah, I, think, I guess I'll just I'll leave it there for now. Um, I'm going to take a question from um, a first year anthropology student uh, who writes that uh, I'm new to the discipline. I would like to ask what you think about knowledge production within academia, especially in the types of 
uh, knowledge production when researching marginalized groups. It seems that when theory is produced, oftentimes it's in ways that are inaccessible to the exact groups it may be addressing. Um, I could also, yeah, I think, yeah, let's uh, take that. Did you want to follow up with another? Yeah, I could also time? ask another question or maybe we just take this one because, uh, yeah. Not yeah. a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was just going to say that I agree with the premise of the question, <laughs> and I think um, I don't necessarily have an answer. I just think that it's, it's quite true about the yes. how anthrop anthropological knowledge circulates um, and where it doesn't. But you know, I think my previous the answer to the previous question just sort of gestures at um, some possibilities and also just the different kinds of horizons we can imagine for our work. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and what I would have said um, there, what I'd like to say there is, yes, of course, ditto, I, I, I agree. Uh, but, but the challenge, I think, and, and there are many scholars, Indigenous First Nations scholars, as well as um, scholars, African and Latin America, the Caribbean, et cetera, who are, are deeply committed to thinking about theory making as part of everyday life. So if you think about parables and stories, one of the things that I've been working on are Nancy stories as theory making, as modes of thought, of, as, as ways of, of contemplating uh, the ways that knowledge gets organized and organized sometimes in ways that are unintelligible or unrecognizable to Western university theorizing. And so, so absolutely, yes, I agree with that point, but also that the, the, the call is for those of us who are academics or doing policy work and other kinds of work and, and theory building to, to really push ourselves to, to think about these other domains of knowledge making, the modes of engagement, multimodal forms of engagement that tell us something about the world that, that get reproduced through practice and that might not look in ways that might be recognizable based on a syllabus at in a university class, but but actually are forms of theory building and that we we don't lead that people who are engaging in such work and, and, and reproducing their own forms of learning lead in, in these conceptualizations. And I think that's the ongoing challenge ahead. It's not a new uh, call for action, but it's one that I think we have to continue to insist on and, and not simply relegate or claim theory making to and elsewhere. Thank you, thank you. That's a, that's a very important point. And sort of related uh, comes a question from Maria Guzman Gallegos. She asks that central to anthropological practice has been this movement of understanding and describing other humans for then reinstating our categories of knowledge as if they were not situated, as if they did not have particular genealogies. My question is how we can engage with the people we work with in such a way that their analytics uh, challenge and decenter our own categories, including our understanding of the human, humanity, and humanism. I feel like that question just stumped us. Um, but what I'll <laughs> say again is that um, I think this is precisely what the objective of our work has to be. Um, mm. Again, so, so Kamar is sort of gesturing to the fact that um, theory is not something that's simply produced when we return to the university, when we write up um, our sort of ethnographic findings, when we apply certain kinds of imported frameworks. Um, I think that this, this perhaps is what the, um, um, this question raises is that we have to sort of invert um, how we understand the direction that theory is produced, um, that we, if anything, um, again, are in service of the people um, whom we work with, um, and that we have to think about how those theories about the world um, that are already present, they don't need to be imparted by us as anthropologists to individuals in the places where we live um, or work, um, but rather, um, if we're not pushing back against sort of the dominant episteme, against the dominant theories, 
um, that again have come in a very Hegelian um, fashion from simply sort of the minds and pontifications of scholars of previous generations, um, then I'm not sure what the value of ethnography is. That said, I think that there is a distinct value to this very project um, that is not about pluralizing the, the sort of category of the human. It's not about proving that people can be human in a variety of ways that are not immediately legible to us, but to say that there are actually imminent critiques of, of the human, of man, of coloniality, of authority um, that already exist in the world. And I think those can be quite helpful to us. Again, if we kind of shed our own chauvinism about um, ourselves as theorists, about where theory emanates from and, and expand the kind of theaters in which these conversations are, are able to happen. And I, and I think that means writing in other venues. I think it means engaging in conversation in other venues. Mm. Um, and I think it sort of brings me back to my original point about you know, is our effort to decolonize anthropology um, or is our effort to sort of um, place ourselves in service of the larger project of decolonization? Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think that we spend, you know, quite a lot of energy um, attempting to decolonize anthropology as the kind of technical fix that I talk about in, in the article. Um, and I think if we, if we sort of um, decenter ourselves in that process to say that um, you know, th there is no decolonizing anthropology prior to um, the decolonization of the world in general. Um, I think that sort of sets us on a, a much more sort of productive path. Yeah, let me just add to that quickly. And I, I know that we're, we're running out of time here. Um, I, I think in relation to that question, though, uh, that on one hand, the, the kind of individualized practices that are part of the, the proposed praxis uh, in the draft principles do speak to questions of attunement, uh, understanding humans in their own terms, um, the, 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 the kind of accountabilities that go beyond sending back a booklet or a publication. Uh, but, I, but I think for the, the, the midterm, where we are now, for those of us in institutions, in centers um, that are working you know, with, in, in a range of spaces, that the demand that it, it's not simply a matter of individually making reform, that it, our institutions need to demand that faculty remake into knowledge production as well. And it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. What does it take? You know, if you think about a faculty member that's been teaching for 30 years, the same canonical course, year after year that's doing a number of other, you know, has other obligations and isn't necessarily committed to changing and rereading a whole new domain of, 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 of scholarship that might take an, a sabbatical to dedicate to, to read and to become attuned with the points of uh, departure that are in that other scholarship, the forms of language, etc. In what way can institutions provide incentives or demand that faculty be accountable by coming up to speed by responding to student demands, by um, recreating syllabi um, that, that speak back to uh, the colonial gaze, that, that push us to think uh, about the anthropological project and its, and its deeply fraught history in a different way. And so making in the same way that we might make demands that, that faculty uh, write um, diversity statements, for example, saying what we've done this year, that's different and the institutionalization of, I know at, at UCLA, this, this is part of a, an, an every go, everyday tradition and we're seeing it at, at more and more institutions that faculty are compelled and forced to at least identify how they're participating in, in the production of what's you know, diversity. At the same time, what about our curriculum? What about our syllabi? What about our seminars? How are people contemporizing, especially in anthropology? So, um, so the, the point really is that we move from the individualization and, and make uh, ensure that institutions make our faculty accountable uh, in, the, in knowledge production. And it goes both ways. Um, I really want to take one final question, which is basically, it's quite provocative and it sums up a lot of the other questions we have. Uh, is that okay? Can I go on with uh, one final question then? Yeah? 
Okay, so this is about, you know, the tribalism of anthropology as a discipline and, you know, our uh, vernacular, um, ac academic uh, vernacular. So uh, the question is from Heath Cabot and um, it's thanks so much for this. I do very much enjoy the discussion and perspectives of the speakers, but I can't help but notice the use of jargon in this discussion that I don't think many anthropologists themselves really know how to operationalize, let alone anyone in the quote outside world, so to speak. A lot of this discussion is quote up here the principles, for instance, are really hard to translate. How to pierce through this somewhat inward looking discussion with these normative registers? Can we shift the language itself? Is it about talking to people outside the discipline who may force a sense of concreteness? Yeah, okay, I guess that's that's for me to, to end with. Um, I think that we have multiple audiences. And of course, this is a discussion about anthropology and for the most part, um, an engagement with anthropological questions. Um, some of the work that we're doing in, involves um, public audiences, public facing that requires different ways of framing questions, different ways of thinking through questions. What is jargon, but really formulations of articulating, you know, the way that what we know and how we we speak uh, through efficiencies or you know through everyday practice where we're used to speaking in a particular way um, and and so I think part of the the point is that we have to determine who our audience is and, and understand our audience and figure out how we engage in in what ways and through what language economies um, and you know that may very well be seen as jargon and, and dismissed, but it's also um, part of efficient ways of, of communicating with particular people who are reading similar things. Um, that's not a defense, but, or maybe it is perhaps, but, um, you know, the question is an academic one. And sometimes it's also a matter of different kinds of people um, trying to think about what it is that is being communicated. And I think it, it, it also, is a dual relationship that you know what what we say how we translate and how the people with whom we work and engage also translate us um, and and so it's it's our audience but it's also uh, about determining who we're speaking with and for what purpose just to echo kamar's point as well um yeah one sort of the the borders that sort of define this conversation have a lot to do with the kind of language that circulates here. But I also want to point out that there's, there's often an assumption that um, by sort of shirking or limiting the use of jargon, then we're able to better impart some essential knowledge to certain kinds of publics um, that uh, is otherwise inaccessible um, because we're using sort of specialized anthropological or theoretical language. Um, I think also what I'm trying to say here is that um, it's not, perhaps we don't always have the tools or the answers um, for these publics. Perhaps sometimes actually the answers are already there, but there are various sort of um, structures of repression, of violence um, that don't allow certain kinds of potent political alternatives to thrive in our contemporary world. So I would really also just push back against the idea that, um, you know, anthropologists have all the answers um, to the project of liberation, to the project of decolonization, if we would only articulate it in, in clearer and more accessible terms. Um, I actually dispute that fundamentally, and perhaps that you might remind us that um, we also have a lot to learn um, from our own sort of institutional and political locations. Um, but again, so to echo what Kamari said, um, you know, when I'm talking to a sort of an audience in, you know, in the Caribbean about, again, the realities of sort of extractive industries and politics, um, we're having a different kind of conversation. And in fact, it's often laden with very different jargon that's, you know, familiar to many Trinis. Trinis know the, the sort of the, the intimate details of oil and gas markets and petrochemical infrastructure because they've been working in it for a hundred years, right? So 
Um, again, the jargon is, is context dependent. Um, and, and again, I, I guess I'm trying to, to sort of push against the idea that, um, that scholars or anthropologists have the answers um, that we are sort of holding back um, precisely because of the kind of language that we use. Yeah, and I, I like that point because I, I think it, um, it, it forces us to assume a position of humility in the sense that many of us trained um, to, you know, for many years to write and speak in a particular way actually have to retrain ourselves in our public engagements. Um, so in op-ed op writing or in the ways that we might approach certain publics and not others or intimate relations and, and how we translate in relation to them. And I think that that has to be a, an ongoing commitment as well. And one of the things that we're doing is actually doing public facing writing and teaching anthropologists uh, to write in particular ways through our collaboration with Sapiens. And, um, and so this is, this is important. This is certainly important work, but I, I think that any critiques, um, you know, can't simply be a dismissal of language and speech practices as jargon and therefore you know, faulty or problematic. That too isn't productive or useful. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you all very much. Um, uh, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. So uh, let me also, you know, uh, apologize to all our S and Ds who posed questions that we we weren't able to field in this discussion. It it seems to me that we're uh, landing up in a very fam familiar space uh, for many anthropologists, in which the conclusion to it all is that we. Uh, we unfortunately do not have all the, the answers, but we do have a lot of good questions. Uh, but I mean, that's um, that's not uh, an, an appallingly bad uh, place to be in. Uh, let me uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, Professor uh, Kamari Clark and uh, Assistant Professor Ryan Cecil Jobson for this. Uh, wonderful discussion and uh, your willingness uh, uh, to engage in this uh, Zoom webinar from uh, Theory from the Margins. Uh, I need to do a little bit of advertising towards the very end of it. Um, I should also thank, uh, you know, all of you who attended. Um, we have a number of, of um, splendid ev events coming up uh, later this term. Uh, starting with uh, our next Zoom webinar with uh, Cambridge University Professor Priyam Bada Kupal on February 19th. Uh, the time is to be, be announced later, but we will be discussing her uh, important book, Insurgent Empire, Anti-Colonial Resistance and British Descent, uh, which was published by Verso in 2019. Uh, now, the Theory from the Margins event, you can also follow through our website, uh, www.theoryfromthemargins.com, our Facebook pages, uh, and uh, if you were unable for some reason um, to follow this um, Zoom webinar um, on Facebook Live, you can also watch a recording that we will be uploading uh, on uh, our YouTube channel at Theory from the Margins. So thank you all uh, very much and goodbye. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.